I want to start um, now that we're back into election season. You're back campaigning. It's a little bit of a different look for you this season because you're not the incumbent. Can we talk just about getting back into the swing of election season and campaigning and how it's different in this role now? Well, it's obviously very different. Uh, when you don't have to travel back to Washington on a weekly basis, uh, it gives you a lot more time. But then with throw COVID into that and there's a lot less events to attend because obviously we're on quarantine. Uh, so it does make things a little bit different, uh, but it also makes it a little bit easier to balance things uh, because doing Zoom or the majority of stuff being online, you can sit at home and Zoom uh, with different folks across uh, different platforms and uh, relatively quickly instead of having an hour drive between each and every stop. Does it make it more difficult to connect with those constituents? You know, I think people have gotten used to the idea. They obviously don't like it, uh, but I think they've gotten used to it because it's part of their daily lives. Uh, kids are going to school through the same process. Um, a lot of uh, parents or, or folks are working through that same process. And so they've gotten used to it and they're, they're able to adapt to it, but it's obviously not preferred. Tell us, why are you rerunning? You know, it's important. Uh, I feel like there's unfinished business. We had a lot going on, especially on the waterfront, and uh, we made a lot of progress, and we even got to the point where things were signed in uh, through the record decision uh, just this year. Uh, but those were all products of work that had, got, had years uh, of, of time into it. And uh, we wanted to continue that process and continue that progress, and we've got a lot more work still to do. Obviously, immigration is something that we were never able to accomplish. It's something that both sides have struggled with. You know, Obama, when he had full control of both the House and the Senate, he wasn't able to do it. President Trump wasn't able to do it. But it's something that we keep, see, we seem to keep getting closer because people seem to understand the, the necessity of it and both sides of it. And I think we're getting to a point where it's possible, and, and I'd like to be one of the ones to help move that forward. Let's talk a little bit about, um, since we're talking about election season, the campaign ads that have come out um, against your opponent here. Now, TJ Cox has said that you side with the president 99% of the time. What is your uh, reaction to that? You know, it's the same thing that they've been saying for years. The problem with that is, is you can take any number of votes, uh, and we vote thousands of times when you're in Congress, and if you take 30 votes uh, and decide that those are the ones you want to look at, you can make anyone look like they vote with anyone 100% of the time. And sadly, it's, it's not really a real uh, outlook of, of what the votes are. Uh, but when you look at votes that I've taken, obviously every vote I've taken is, is for the 21st Congressional District and it's focused on making sure the lives of the people here are better. And that's the only uh, real rationale I look at when I'm making a decision on how to vote. Now, also another campaign ad, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee press release claiming that you refused to pay your workers and filed for bankruptcy. Can you talk a little bit about that and your reaction to that? So, uh, as happens in a lot of agriculture across the, the country and especially here in the Central Valley, the dairy industry has had a very tough time. And, uh, and sadly, my family is one of the ones that had those same problems as many other farmers across the United States. And uh, here in California specifically, we lost a large percentage of dairy farmers over the last 10 years, from 2009 on to to 2019 was a very tough environment to have a business in. The other problem that I had going on was as a member of Congress, I'm ethically not allowed to take a, a managing role or make any decision in the process. And I think there's a big distinction between TJ and myself is when I was, uh, when I was a member of Congress, I took that role seriously and I took that oath seriously. And you're not allowed to be in a management role uh, in those businesses. You're not allowed to be part of those day-to-day -day operation decisions. And, and that did cost me in, uh, in the long run, but it was something that lots of families here throughout the Central Valley went through the same thing I did. So are you saying that if, for instance, you were not in that position, maybe that outcome wouldn't have happened with the family farm? It's hard to say because, as, as I said earlier, there's a lot of families who have lost their farms over the years, and I'm no different than many of the other same families. I, mean, I have friends of mine that I grew up with that had farms that no longer uh, have those today and they were on their farms on a daily basis doing the best they could. I mean, it's just a tough environment and uh, things have gotten a little bit better over the years and we've made some changes. Stuff that I put in the farm bill when I was in Congress were, were helpful for a lot of farmers but it's still a tough industry to be in and we see consolidation uh, happen at a rapid pace and, and it just seems to happen even faster now. I want to talk a little bit about the coronavirus since we're in there, we're in the midst of it right now. How do you feel like the state of California has been doing handling the coronavirus pandemic? You know, frustrated uh, because, and it's hard to sit here and point fingers at any one certain person because obviously this is something that was new to everyone. I mean, really no one had any idea of how to handle it. And even developing the test took a process to start because it had to be developed and, and we have to make sure that they're reliable. But 
when you look at what the impact it's had on our economy and you look around the country and other states have handled it differently, I, I feel like we could have done things a little bit uh, different. I was really frustrated, especially in the very beginning, when they shut down a lot of our local stores and our, our retail. And, and then what happened was they were consolidating the majority of folks into the, a few stores that were open. And so uh, normally I would walk into one of my hardware stores and have lots of room around me. And because everything else was closed, I was surrounded by folks and waiting in long lines. And it seems like they just, people were con uh, more consolidated grouped into larger groups into these stores and it made the situation worse and it had a huge impact on our local economy. Obviously our cities and our counties are really going to struggle, especially our cities because of the sales tax. Uh, I wish they had taken a little bit different approach, I think uh, a little bit softer going in, making sure that we uh, looked at social distancing, uh, enforced uh, the mask and all the different rules that play a role, uh, but automatically just shutting things down, I, I think it's had a negative impact on our economy and it's going to take years to recover from. Mm -hmm. And I want to get into the economy here shortly. So what would you have done differently? Would you have left things open longer and just use some of those health practices? I think uh, looking at the health practices, uh, making sure that we try to enforce that as, uh, to the best of our ability and make sure that uh, we don't shut everything down 100% like they did. Uh, would have been a better approach. And obviously hindsight 2020 make, is a little bit easier. Uh, something as new as COVID and as unknown as COVID and as transmittable as COVID, I think they had to do what they thought was right at the time. And looking back, I think we should have done things a little bit different. Now, again, in Kern County, oil has especially been impacted because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Specifically, a recent study showed that the oil industry contributed $197 million to the county. Now, county officials are saying that the current budget forecasts are anticipating a 40% reduction in oil-related assessed valuation between, between January 2020 and January 2021. So what would be your role in to help those industries if elected again? Well, getting the economy open is going to play a role in getting uh, oil prices is back to where they need to be because if people are stuck at home without it able to travel or, uh, or without being able to go anywhere um, that's that's gonna have a direct impact on oil prices we have to have people uh, moving uh, traveling uh, and and getting around and that's gonna have the, probably the largest impact as far as the government coming in I mean they can buy some oil uh, and put it in the, the stocks but at the end of the day the reality is the best thing for our economy is to make sure our economy is up and going and moving and that's gonna help all uh, different uh, branches of our uh, economy. It's good for agriculture, it's good for oil, it's good for our uh, Main Street, it's good for our stores, it's good for everything. How do we balance that though to reopen the economy to help save jobs, help our counties and our cities while also balancing the fact that people need to be safe and their health? Well, we've just got to keep enforcing the social distancing, the, the protective uh, masks and uh, sanitizing hands, washing hands. It's just something we really have to enforce and really pay attention to because sitting at home is is having a lasting impact. I mean, obviously what, what we see going on with our children right now struggling through uh, uh, through uh, Zoom classes and most of the kids I hear from, most of the teachers I talk to are telling me that kids are failing and they're struggling because they don't have the ability to communicate quite like they did. An interaction at school has a huge impact. And this is gonna have a long impact on, on our communities for, uh, uh, for us for, and we need, to, we need to start addressing it quickly. Let's talk a little bit um, going along the same threat of coronavirus and healthcare. Of course, we know in the past when you were in office, you voted to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. Where do you stand on that now? Well, I still think that the Affordable Care Act is having a devastating impact here in the Central Valley. Uh, one of the things that we've always struggled with is having doctors, uh, um, having facilities here uh, that can stay in business and survive. And in communities throughout the 21st, we've struggled. So you've got uh, Kalinga that's uh, shut, pretty much shut their doors. Uh, you've got Corcoran that shut their doors. You had Delano that uh, almost lost their facility. Now it's been purchased by a larger facility but we struggle. And then doctors leaving the practice, retiring, those are all things that are a direct impact of uh, the Affordable Care Act. As far as insurance rates, uh, they've gone up, they skyrocketed, even for folks like myself. Uh, my rates where they were 10 years ago versus what we pay today, uh, they've pretty much doubled. And so giving people the opportunity to have private insurance or employers the ability to be able to afford the private insurance so that people can have choices are something that has an impact on our doctors and our facilities because if we're going to rely on only uh, reimbursement rates from the federal government to try to attract doctors, specialists, and facilities into our communities, it, it's just not going to happen. And so we've got to find ways to diversify and expand our opportunities, expand the opportunity of people being able to have private insurance, uh, change the way that we reimburse at the federal level uh, so that we can get those doctors to continue to serve our communities. And what's going to happen if we continue down this path is doctors and facilities and investments are going to continue to flee areas like ours with high Medicaid populations and go into areas with higher private insurance. 
and we've got to reverse that trend. We've got to keep attracting dollars back into our community so that we can keep those investments here. How do you feel like the president has handled the coronavirus pandemic? I mean, just like I've struggled with the way the governor's handled it, and I've struggled with certain things the president has, uh, uh, the way he's handled it. But that's the problem that we've had with COVID. It's such a new thing to sit here and point fingers and say, oh, this guy screwed up. Obviously, looking back 2020 hindsight, I'm sure he, th he thinks that there's things he could have done different or should have done different, just as our governor would say the same thing. Um, I think he's done his best. I think he's trying to do what he thinks is right. He had uh, Dr. Fossey there saying uh, and, and speaking on his behalf and, and even defending him at times on some of his actions. But I'm sure there's lots of things that we can point to and say that there were mistakes. But the goal now is to look forward and, and look for solutions and look for what works and try to get things going again. Let's go back to in 2016, you noted that then you could not support then candidate Donald Trump's campaign. Where do you stand now? Do you support the president? Well, I've when we uh, started in 2016, it was obviously a different thing because there were a lot of promises being made. But one of the things that's very, very important to me, it's something that I spend a lot of time on, is obviously water. And uh, this president has done more for us on water than any other president in history, and uh, or at least in my uh, lifetime. And uh, when he came to California and he uh, signed uh, that record decision, which came from when he signed the biological opinion uh, back in October of 2018, that's something that had a direct impact. And if it wasn't for the governor here, Governor Newsom of California, uh, suing to stop that, it would have had a very big impact for us here in the Central Valley. And I do believe that this president wins and he continues to fight, especially the Secretary of Interior, David Bernhardt, and fights that uh, Governor Newsom in court. Uh, they will win, they will be successful. They'll defend the sound science and help to continue to deliver water to here in the Central Valley. And you've got projects like the Frank Kern Canal. The president has been very supportive of that. That affects all of Kern County, especially the whole east side. And those are all communities that are part of the 21st Congressional District. So it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. If it had been Bernie Sanders, if it had been Hillary Clinton, and they had done those things, the, the idea is to work with that person and move those projects forward. And he's done that, and that's something that we haven't had in the past. President Obama, when he came to the Central Valley a number of years ago, uh, came to the Central Valley, wouldn't meet with any Republicans, and when he was here, instead of talking about the actual issues that were going on on the ground, he never once addressed the actual issues, but he, started to, he tried to blame everything on climate change, when we had actual policies in place that were diverting water away from us out into the ocean. And this president has done the, uh, the complete opposite. He's actually worked with us. He worked with, then he continued the same uh, career folks working with the Department of Interior, all the scientists, all the ecologists, and they looked at the science, they developed the science under President Obama and President Trump actually implemented it, and it's going to be beneficial for us. And when you have someone that's done that much for us here in the Central Valley, how could you not support them? I, I want to go back to one thing you said. You said that back in 2016 there was a lot of promises being made. Now some of those promises that made you hesitate then, have you seen those follow through and have that has that built your confidence in him now? So on the water, yes. The water, absolutely. Uh, on the economy, yes. I mean, our, uh, obviously, uh, when you see what's going on in the economy across the country, I mean, here in the Central Valley, we always struggle. Water is a big part of that. Uh, but we've seen a huge imp uh, improvement. And even when you talk to the average worker out there, if you try to hire a construction crew right now to do a job, uh, you struggle to find people because everyone is out working and, and the employees themselves see it because they're in desperate demand. I'm trying to get some work done on some corrals at, at home and it took me months to finally get a contractor to show up and, and help us do that work. And even talking to the employees, he says that the employees have plenty of options out there and that's because there's a lot of demand for work. That means there's a strong economy. And so the average voter, if they look at their pocketbook and say, well, we passed a tax bill to put more money in their pockets. Now we also passed a tax bill that helped uh, uh, encourage businesses to make investments so that they can save on their taxes. Sorry. But if you look at uh, the fact that we uh, focused on water, he worked as, to the best of his ability, except, other than what Governor Newsom did here in the state of California. And you look at the tax bill that we passed to put more money in the uh, pockets of uh, hardworking people, but also encouraged employers to make those investments so that we can grow our economy. Those are all things that had a direct impact, and that's something that I think is good for our economy, and it's something that I'm glad I, was, I played a part of. What about his position on immigration? So on immigration, it's obviously there's a lot of rhetoric there that I don't agree with and things that were said by the president that I disagree with. But at the end of the day, securing the border I think is important. But also a guest worker program is important. We did work with the president on some of that. He also made an offer to Congress that if you look at the actual details of it, he offered a, a broader swath of uh, help on the DACA population than President Obama did. And he was actually asking for less money than President Obama was on border security. And he never got the cre uh, credit for that. I mean, obviously some of his uh, uh, rhetoric, uh, some of the tweets probably hurt him in, in those debates, 
Uh, but the reality is, is uh, immigration is something that's important to me. It's something that there are times I disagree with the president on, but where I agree with them, I'll work with them. And where I disagree with them, I'll, I'll take them on. I want to go back to water now that you brought that up as well. So where do you stand along with the river restoration infrastructure? So water is important to us. Uh, and the only way to get water here to the Central Valley, into our communities and into our farms is by diverting water uh, our direction. Uh, and that's why things like the biological opinion are so important. Uh, there were people that started under the Obama administration that looked at the science on how to manage water moving through uh, from those rivers through the Delta out into the ocean. And sound science has proven that uh, we can serve both needs. We can protect the fish, we can protect species, keep the Delta clean, but also divert water here to Central Valley. And there's a lot of communities here that have 100% uh, reliance on that water from the Delta. And so, uh, do I want sound policy? Yes, that's what I fought for. Uh, every time I uh, passed any piece of legislation, it was always bipartisan, and it was with the sole focus of making sure that we had water, but also making sure the species are protected. The, fi the language that I introduced in Congress and tried to pass through uh, the Senate actually had language in there that uh, helped take care of uh, the invasive species. So you're trying to protect the environmentalists and the fishing industry are trying to protect baby smelt and, and the salmonoids. Well, they've introduced large, uh, largemouth bass uh, into the delta for recreational purposes. It's not a native species. And what do they do? They eat the fish that they're trying to protect. And so one of the pieces of my legislation was to make sure that we uh, lifted the take limit so we can catch the largemouth bass, get as many of them out there as possible, and allow the fish that we're trying to protect to survive. And that's something that we know from fact, from actual inspections. And if, if you go out there and you catch a largemouth bass, you can find it all day long where their bellies are full of the fish that they're trying to protect. And so to blame us in the Central Valley for diverting our water away for things that we know are really going on, and studies have shown it's anywhere from 60 to 90 percent of uh, those fish are consumed by the bass, why don't we do something about it? And so that's why I put it in my bill. And we can do that. We can help the communities here by delivering water, and we can help our farmers here by delivering water and protect the Delta smelt. Let's also talk about climate change because, of course, we know here in Kern County we deal with wildfires, we deal with the heat wave that we've seen here. Diminished snowpack can be an issue. So how do you plan to make sure that we are tackling climate change issues if elected? Well, I mean, we have to do our part to keep our air clean. And I do believe that uh, human race does play a role, obviously, the pollution. And we've gotten a lot better at that. And before these fires, uh, our air quality was actually improving. And uh, I think we can continue to do that. But I think it plays a larger role than just the vehicles that we drive but also the way we manage those forests. In mean, those forests, uh, we obviously had a few dry years, but because we had bad practices in place where we were not managing our forests properly, you had a huge population of trees, and in the limited water supply, those trees that were there became stressed, and they became more vulnerable to things like the bark beetle. And then they died. They became basically kindling for these fires that they can barely fight and barely stop and now we've got our air quality where it is today. And so all the progress that we made over the years of re replacing tractors and replacing cars and uh, replacing power sources have all been diminished by fires that got out of control and we can't do anything about. Well, the policy should have been changed years ago. Some of that's federal and some of that's state, but it's stuff that has to be done, has to be addressed if we're gonna prevent these types of fires from continuing. So recently, of course, Governor Newsom um went ahead and said that they want to ban the sales of gas-powered vehicles by 2035. What are your thoughts on that? That's going to destroy the economy here in the Central Valley. It's especially in Kern County where oil plays a huge part, but it's also going to play a big part in uh, in hurting the, the poorest of among us. Who can afford to go out and buy a Tesla? And they're expensive vehicles. And so, and then when you look at the amount of demands already out there for electricity, when our days are hitting 100 to 110 degrees, how much are, is it going to cost for the average family to keep their families comfortable at home? Or are they going to be looking for cooling centers? Are they going to start to crowd the grocery stores and the malls so that they can stay comfortable in a 100 to 10, a 10 degree day? And these are all things that are going to play a role. And if the governor thinks that this is the path he's going to go uh, and do, it's going to have an impact on the people uh, here in the Central Valley, especially our poorest among us, because it's going to have a direct impact on their pocketbooks. They can't afford to buy those expensive electric vehicles. And obviously, it's going to have an impact on the jobs here because we have a, a large oil uh, industry. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know that we can talk potentials and hypotheticals all day, but we do know homelessness is an issue here. And if people continue to lose their jobs, we could potentially see more of that. How do you plan to stop some of these things from happening? Or what do you suggest that we do in order to save those jobs and keep people employed, keep people in their homes and away from homelessness? No, common sense. I mean, obviously, uh, going into 
I'm an all of the above approach kind of guy. I do like electric vehicles. I like gas vehicles. I, I want people to be able to afford and buy their vehicles and drive. I want businesses to be able to buy equipment and, and run their businesses and hire employees. How are we going to help with the homeless population? Like you said, is to keep people employed, have opportunity for these folks. But obviously drugs play a role in this. When you see, when you talk to the folks that are running these homeless shelters, 90% of the people that are out there on the streets is because of a drug related issue. I mean, there's obviously some that are legitimately uh, uh, have mental issues, but there are the majority of them that are, it, it's connected to drug use and, and the amount of damage is done to them over the years. And so uh, it's important that, that we address all those concerns, but I, I do believe a strong economy, opportunity for people to, to have a job and take care of themselves and feed their family plays a vital role in, in someone's self-worth and the, allows them the opportunity to continue to serve themselves, their family, and, and our communities. I want to go back to um, the 2018 election. Of course, in the in the primary, you were leading back in 2018, but then in the election, by a very very slim margin, you lost. I guess, what are you doing differently this time around to secure that seat? Well, I mean, 2018 was a blue wave year. It was probably one of the best years Democrats have had in a long time, and so obviously that played a role in it. Um, as far as what am I doing different, obviously we've changed things on our operation as far as ground walking, uh, door knocking, uh, phone calls, all those things that we do in the campaign. So we've been focused a lot more on the ground and talking to voters as best of our ability with COVID. Um, but, but yeah, it, it's, it's uh, a, lot of, a lot more work, a lot more time on the ground and obviously changing some folks on, on the team. Um, the nice thing is, is that people are very motivated. I've had more volunteers now than I've ever had. People that thought I was safe two years ago now realize that uh, they uh, that I wasn't safe, and they're stepping up to be helpful. And so uh, I've had over 400 volunteers help just on making phone calls. Over 150 volunteers help knock doors. Um, it, it's actually been pretty amazing to see how how excited people are about the race. Do you have any concerns because we do know presidential election years, more people do turn out to vote, and that tends to be more Democratic voters. Do you have any concerns about that? Well, a higher turnout for both sides is what usually happens in the presidential. And what happens in a, in a wave year after a president's uh, first election, for the middle of a president's first term, is that one side, it's usually a one-sided uh, wave. And so President Obama struggled, obviously, in 2010, and President Trump went through the same thing in 2018. It's really no different. Uh, but when you go into a presidential cycle, uh, both sides turn out in large numbers, and I think there's going to be a huge turnout uh, here. And obviously, th that'll help both of us. Uh, but when you look at the final numbers, I mean, losing by 862 in the best possible situation for the other side of the aisle, I, I think I like my odds right now. So when we're talking about voting moving ahead, we know that a lot of the voters in the congressional district are Democratic. So how do you get them to come across and actually vote for you? You know, I've been very uh, successful in that over the years. Uh, from my first run in 2012 till uh, this past race, even when you look at how President Trump performed in the district, he lost the district by 14 and I had won it by 15. And you go into a blue wave year, the best year that they've had in a long time on the other side, and we still came within 862 votes. It wasn't even one point, uh, uh, a whole percentage point uh, race. So I, I like my odds. I like the way things are looking. Uh, and especially with the amount of motivated support we've got out there, uh, I'm really excited about the numbers. If elected, what would you like to accomplish? I mean, one of my first actions I think will be, wa uh, will be a water bill. I'm excited about moving another water bill. I, I think it's important. It's something that's, uh, we've always taken these little wins. Every time we introduce bills, we put a lot of pressure on our senators and we get little chunks of, of what we want, but uh, we've got a lot more work to do. Uh, obviously the immigration front, I, I do want to see something done on immigration. It's important for our communities. It's important for our country. Um, and it's important for, uh, for just jobs in our industries here in the Central Valley, especially agriculture. And so it's something that I, I really do want to work on. It's something I'm excited about, something I'm interested in. And then obviously the business climate in general, I mean, trade policy, things like uh, uh, tax policy, things that benefit and encourage more job growth. Uh, if it's to focus on uh, helping businesses invest in certain communities so that we can help uh, some of the depressed communities do a little bit better, or if it's to help people uh, who are in desperate times, maybe out of prison, to have more opportunities so that they don't go down the path of doing drugs and living on the streets. And there's a lot of opportunities, things that I'd like to get involved in, things I'd like to do. Uh, that I'd like to start in this next Congress as soon as I have the opportunity. Now, why do you think people should vote for you over TJ Cox? Well, one, I have an understanding of the district. I'm from the district. My family's uh, been here 
uh, my kids go to school in the district. I mean, having a connection to the community is important. To, to go to Washington, to be called a representative, you have to be a part of that sample, and I'm a part of this sample. Uh, knowing the district like I do, understanding the different industries the way I do, and understanding the issues that we face is something I think is very important. And so when we go to Washington and have those debates or you have those opportunities to make uh, uh, solutions for for the people of the 21st Congressional District, you have to understand first the problems and how they impact us. And I think that's a huge difference between the two of us. This has been my life, this has been what I've done my entire life, has lived here in this community and suffered like my neighbors and uh, celebrated our wins like my neighbors. And I want to have that opportunity to help solve some of the problems that we face here in the Central Valley and take that voice to Washington and, and bring back some more solutions. Now, the president has raised doubts about the integrity of this year's election given the pandemic. Do you share any of those same doubts? I mean, there's always uh, issues with the voting system, and uh, we saw some of those in 2018. Uh, to say it's widespread, I think, is a stretch, but it is something that we have to be con uh, conscious of, and we know that there are a lot of ballots going on. I have lots of friends of mine that received uh, two and three ballots. People posted on Facebook even the last few days uh, where they received two ballots for their, them and their spouse and three people that hadn't lived at that house for three years or 30 years, and it's, it's something that uh, is concerning, but uh, I think uh, our our elections offices here, especially in the four counties that I, that I touch, are, are good folks and I think they do their very best to hold honest and fair elections and, and we're going to keep our eyes open and do our best to make sure that it is as such. Now, win or lose, will you accept the results of the race? Yes. I've been on both sides of this uh, through my career and, and so I, I've been able to accept both sides. I just, we like to make sure that everything is fair and honest. Any final thoughts that you'd like to share if, if people didn't tune into the whole thing? What would you hope they take away from this? I think it's important for people to know that uh, my background, my, my whole livelihood is dependent on everything here in the Central Valley. Uh, it's agriculture, it's oil, it's the industries that make us who we are. And having a person in Washington that understands that, that has a young family here, that goes to public school, that uh, is part of the community is very important when you decide who you want to send to Washington. You want to have someone that has a life like you or lives like you or, or understands your problems so that when you're uh, struggling, you know that your voice in Washington is fighting for you. And that's my goal in Washington is to fight for everyone in the 21st Congressional District.